want to welcome everybody to our city council meeting. We've got a uh, couple of very special things we want to do here. I'm going to ask uh, Sergeant Butler to come up here for a moment. And uh, he's uh, uh, in charge of our canine friends that are out in the hall. And uh, I've got a, a special recognition certificate that I'm going to read that uh, Sergeant Butler can kind of outline what we're doing. And then we're going to bring in the, the award winners here in a second. It may be a little chaotic, but we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Appreciate everybody coming today. We have the department's patrol canine team here with us today. We have five canine units and their handlers that are here that are going to come in and receive a proclamation from the mayor. Uh, the past couple years, the canine team has had some very extraordinary cases uh, where they have taken a lot of drugs off the street. It's not just one thing to be stopped by a law enforcement officer and have them come up to your car and, and do their their uh, their work. But when they call a canine unit, a lot of times the situation escalates to a level where we can get in, we can do what we need to do, make the uh, city a bit safer, and um, some of the numbers have certainly been reflective of that over the past two years. So recently, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council has uh, heard some of the awards that the folks have received through some of their semi-annual trials, and they are here today to receive that. Without boring you any further, I'll turn this back over to the mayor, and eventually they will come in the door. Stay in your seats. <laughs> if someone tries to go out a back door, hopefully it's because you have treats in your pocket and not something else. Okay, I assure you if you have treats in your pocket, you're going to be safe. If you have anything else in your pockets, we may have to talk later. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. All right, I'm going to read this uh, prior to the entry of our award winners. So our uh, special certificate uh, of recognition goes to SPO Miller and his pal Bello, right? And then we've got Sergeant Miller who has a mere two. We have SPO Peterson who has Jack and uh, Sergeant Kasaki who has Zach. So now therefore I, Mayor of the City of Des Moines, on behalf of our City Council and the citizens of the City of Des Moines do hereby acknowledge the excellent effort of Police K-9 Unit at the USPCA, United States Police Canine Association National Detector Dog Trials in Edina, Minnesota. The results were that all four dogs now hold national certification in narcotics detection. Also, SPO Peterson and K-9 Jack took first place in vehicle search with a perfect score of 100 and a time of 72 seconds. K-9 Amir 2 and Zach also had perfect scores of 100 in the vehicle search. Additionally, at the USPCA Region 21 Police Dog Certification held in Des Moines, all four dogs obtained their regional certification with SPO Miller and Bello took first place in apprehension and Sergeant Kusak and Zach took third place uh, in agility and Sergeant Miller and Amir too were sixth place overall. The four teams also took third place as the department team. We are proud of all of the hard work and efforts that the handlers have put in and the dogs also. Uh, it is shown not only in the awards, but also the work that they have done in and around the city of Des Moines for our citizens to keep our streets safe. Let's bring on our award winners and uh, hold your applause and don't anybody get up too quick. <laughs> All right, now who's this? Emir. This is Emir too. Did you like one? Who's this? Jack, K9 Jack. This is K9 Jack. How are you doing, Mark? Who do we have? Look at my Lord. K9 Jack, right here. Who's this? This is Bello. And I think this one over here is Pike. Is that right? All right. He's also uh, one of our units. And it goes right out. Now, if you all can very lightly, let's give them all a big hand. And, and 
congratulations to all of our units. We kind of decided to uh, we go more detail before the dog made their speech. So thank you very, very much. And uh, again, keep up the great work for all of you. And who wants to take the certificate? I need to give the dog. I'll take mine out. I'll give Sergeant Butler. Sergeant Okay. Sergeant Miller. Sergeant Butler. Sergeant Butler. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to take care of one thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Keep up great work. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it really is amazing the work that uh, um, our police department has done and, and the canine unit has really performed in an outstanding manner. And uh, I know that all of our officers in this room are aware of it and, and know about it, but uh, uh, they're part of the reason that uh, this city continues to be a, a safe place to live. Uh, also, um, we have a another night where the police department uh, spends a lot of time with us and we go to national night out. And I have a pro proclamation to read in that regard. All of our city council generally partakes and goes around the neighborhood uh, association meetings and uh, gets out to all the neighborhoods that, that participate. And, uh, but we know that all the neighborhoods, quite frankly, are working very hard to make Des Moines a better place uh, for all of our citizens. Uh, our proclamation in regard to National Night Out reads as follows. The National Association of Town Watch is sponsoring the 31st annual National Night Out event on Tuesday, August 5th, 2014. And whereas the Des Moines Police Department, neighborhood groups, businesses, and concerned citizens work together diligently throughout the year to prevent crime using sound community policing strategies, and whereas neighborhood awareness, spirit, and cooperation are important themes in the National Night Out Project and are key components in fighting crime and crime prevention. And whereas National Night Out provides an opportunity for Des Moines residents to join together with thousands of other communities across the United States on the same day in support of safer neighborhoods and to demonstrate the value of cooperation uh, in crime prevention efforts. Now therefore, I, the Mayor of the City of Des Moines, on behalf of our City Council, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, August 5th, 2014 as National Night Out right here in Des Moines and call upon all of our residents of Des Moines to recognize and to participate in this special observance. And thank you all and all you neighborhood representatives are in the room also uh, on behalf of, of the council and the police department. Thank you so much for being our partners and uh, let's continue working and keeping uh, our neighborhoods safe and keep working to make them better every day. Let's give our police department everybody. Thank you. Lieutenant David, you want to take the certificate and, and uh, you want to say a couple of quick words? I sometimes ride around with Lieutenant Davy uh, when we go do some of these neighborhood events and uh, uh, we're both still alive and uh, talk about it. So it's very good. I don't know, National Night Out, we have a lot of the hits, so okay. No, this is a great uh, opportunity for the neighbors to get out, uh, turn your porch lights on, get to know your neighbors. Uh, you're the eyes and ears out there. We have some community ambassadors here uh, wearing the blue shirts. They're a part of it. Some of the neighborhood leaders as well. It's a team effort, so uh, there's several events throughout the city. I believe we have 30, 33 different events at uh, like 40-some locations, or vice versa, 40-some events at 33 locations. So uh, we'll be sending that out on a media release, so you'll be able to know where a neighborhood is that's close to you, and, and we just encourage you to participate. All right, let's give my hand again. We will start our meeting shortly. Thank you. Bye, nice to meet you.
Here. Gray. Here. Mahaffey. Here. Hensley. Here. Gatto. Here. We have a quorum. Item two uh, is approving the City of Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency submittal of the Residential Opportunity and Self-Sufficiency Ross Service Coordinator Program grant application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Board communication number 14-358. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak to this item? this hearing not uh, it's been moved any discussion by the board hearing none voice vote good for you um, let's push the button how about that let's be safe seven yes yeah I understand Okay, item three is approving the contract uh, award to Aircon Mechanical James M. Schaefer, Jr., President for Boiler Replacement at Southview Manor at 2417 Southwest 9th Street for $133,175. There were 12 bids that were mailed out and five were received. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak to this award? All right. I'll move item three. Item three has been moved. Any discussion? All in favor, push your buttons. Seven yes. All right. Could we uh, have a motion to adjourn to conclude our meeting? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, before our council meeting, we did have a couple of recognitions. Uh, we talked about National Night Out and also the special recognition for our Police K-9 program. Uh, prior to our start of our meeting this evening, we're going to have a special message from our own council member, Bill Gray. And those who would like to participate, we'd ask you to stand with us at this time. in the paper that we've uh, got the 100 year anniversary of the start of World War I and we just had the uh, anniversary of D-Day so I thought it'd be appropriate to uh, take a quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, he says, it takes no brains to be an atheist. Any stupid person can deny the existence of a supernatural power because man's physical senses cannot detect it. But here cannot be ignored the influence of conscience, the respect we feel for moral law, the mystery of first life or the marvelous order in which the universe moves around us on this earth. All these evidence the handiwork of the benefit, benefit deity. For my part, that deity is the God of the Bible. Thank you.
before we start our city council meeting tonight, I just want to make a uh, quick comment. Uh, there's been a, a um, lot of conversation around um, the unaccompanied minor uh, immigrants slash refugees uh, uh, and a lot of media attention around that. Uh, we've received numerous inquiries uh, from community members wondering what they could do, if they could do anything. I will quickly, quickly want to tell you that um, we have received a great amount of outreach from, quite frankly, hundreds of people. Uh, some of the groups represented were the ACLU of Iowa, Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, the uh, Las Americanas, uh, United Methodist Church, Justice for Our Neighborhoods, the Catholic Charities of Des Moines, uh, LULAC, uh, some immigration advocates, uh, and uh, the Eichner Foundation and a thousand kids. Uh, we uh, um, want to say that, or at least I want to say, that um, Iowans have always been uh, people who have uh, accepted refugees and people seeking, uh, you know, asylum. Uh, this is not a city issue, but we are compassionate people. And we know that Iowans are. And uh, I have personally talked to the president and his team and said that we have people in Des Moines that are ready and willing to help in any way we can uh, if you call upon us. And uh, I just want to give that message to you. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the city of Des Moines uh, in any political way or other way is uh, involved in it, but I know that uh, we have a lot of compassionate people in our, in our city and in this state, and uh, we all want to reach a reasonable resolution in this, this time of need for so many thousands of, of children who are appearing on the doorsteps of the United States. So, having said that, I um, will ask now for the uh, clerk to please take roll. County? Here. Coleman? Here. Moore? Here. Gray? Here. Mahaffey? Here. Hensley? Here. Gatto? Here. We have a quorum. Item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. Move. <clears throat> all right. We'd all push our buttons. Seven yes. All right, item three is approving the consent agenda. Those are items three through 34 this evening. And um, do you have a there other? You. Um, item four N, council member Hensley wishes to speak. Item five, council member Gray wishes to speak. Item 22, council member Moore wishes to speak. Uh, are there any other items on this agenda that anyone would like to have hold for further discussion or clarification. Otherwise, we will take the balance of them as a single vote and uh, go back and discuss the ones that uh, have been pulled to be clarified. <clears throat> Mayor, I didn't get this on the list, but I'd like to talk about 6A. 6A. Right. Seeing none, could we have a motion for the balance, please? Move. It's been moved. Seven yes. All right, takes us first to 4N. Uh, four is licenses and permits and approving alcoholic beverage license applications for the following. 4N is uh, jokers at 216 Court Avenue, Councilmember Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I pulled this off because we have a repeat of a problem that um, I brought to the Council's attention that I thought we had resolved back um, earlier in the year. And that's where um, all of the businesses in Court Avenue are responsible for sharing the cost of the additional police officers down there. We actually had some discussion about that this morning when we were talking about the taxi cab stand. Um, I'm going to continue the hearing on this request from Jokers. Um, I know that it's not the basis that we can actually deny it, but I want to draw, continue to draw attention to the fact that they have not paid 
what they owe the Operation Downtown Community Alliance Group for police service that has been provided um, through the fiscal year into June 30, nor have they paid what they've been billed for for the first six months of this year. And I know that they do have a couple of more days, but um, it's inappropriate when they've reached an agreement that they do not come forward and make the um, payment. So um, we were successful in getting some resolution to that the last time around. Um, hopefully we don't have to continue doing this to get resolution to the item. So I will move uh, that we continue um, jokers until the um, council meeting of August 11th. Any comment? Anybody in the audience? Motion's been made. Christine? Seven yes. <clears throat> Item five. Uh, is an item for consideration of Class C liquor license for Peggy's Inc. of 3020 Forest Avenue. Police Department recommends a denial, and this item was continued from July 14th Council meeting. Uh, Mr. Gray, did you want to make comment here? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. I've uh, I need to have some more information because I got presented some information right before the meeting on the 14th. So I wanted to make sure that I had all my facts before a decision was made. <clears throat> I have talked with City Legal at length. I have talked to uh, the police department. I have talked with uh, Mr. Graziano. And uh, I think in, in the fairest interest, I've learned more about the intricacies of law than I ever want to know again the rest of my life. But, uh, you know, Peggy's is such an institution. It, it's, uh, it's been part of Drake for hundreds of years, and you don't want to be uh, just uh, carte blanche removing a liquor license from them. But uh, in, in going through the... the nuances of the law, what it means, what it has to do. Uh, I feel that it's, it's in the best interest for us uh, to be taking the, the city's uh, best interest in, at heart. And um, I'm going to go along with the uh, police department's recommendation for denial. Um, I think there's uh, some other avenues that Mr. Graziano can follow to, to achieve some of the things that he needs to. But at this point, uh, I, I truly believe that we have to make sure that the city's indemnified and we can move this thing going forward. So uh, I'm going to uh, go with the recommendation from the police department to deny. All right. Is there anybody to speak on this item? And I, I hit the wrong button. I'm in support of the motion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, this was a tough decision, too. I can tell you that. Five yes, two pass. Item 22. Six. <laughs> Item 22 is approving a reprogramming and carryover of prior year's unspent community development block uh, funds. And actually, let me take that back. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Coleman, I skipped your item, and you wanted to talk about 6A, is that correct? Yeah. Six All right, let's go back to uh, item 6A, public improvements. A is ordering construction. The following A is the Grandview Park Water Playground receiving bids of uh, 8 12 14, setting the date of the hearing of 8 25 14, a construction estimate of $300,000. Council communication number 14 365. Mr. Coleman. Uh, thank you. As the mayor said, this is a, a water park in Grandview. I just have two quick things. First off, we've had limited funds to do these. Uh, a number of years ago, we passed a, uh, a plan to, uh, to try and uh, build these around the city. There was health reasons and regulatory reasons and so forth. And uh, first off, congratulations to Councilman Mahaffey for making it happen in Grandview. And I think this is a positive development over there. Second off, I'd like a, a short report from uh, the manager of the Parks Department in terms of how have we, how do we stand on that, you know, whatever it was, a 10-year plan to trade out some of the waiting pools for the splash pools and others. I don't need it today, but um, these are very well used, and uh, you know, my colleagues probably get um, sick of me saying this, but our parks are one of the great things that we have for a lot of our residents. It's free and safe 
entertainment and recreation and family time and uh, I just want to make sure that we're staying true to that so I'll move it I'm su very supportive of this and just wanted to recognize Councilman Mahaffey's work and making that happen for the war. I would make a comment I want to thank the Parks Department for finally getting around we waited a number of years for this to happen and now finally we're going to get it uh, accomplished and thanks to the Parks Good job. Department. Seven yes. All right now to 22. Uh, item 22 is approving the reprogramming of the carrier private years unspent community development block grant CWG funding and other funds for the 2014 HUD consolidated plan programs council communication number 14-355 Mr. Moore well I wanted to speak uh, directly to the issue of uh, housing demolition of nuisance abatement um, so the citizens understand there's going to be about $163,000, $164,000 rolled over from last year, and this will only take care of the demolition of four to five homes. Um, the other thing I want to touch on with this is we have 58 structures ready for demolition, and I'm wondering why in the world we got rollover money to start with. It should have been spent. and. Um, I think some of the other council members will agree that you can't attend a neighborhood meeting without hearing about house demolition nowadays. I think that we need to take a look and see what we can do to make adjustments. We have to, at, at this rate, uh, we've got more um, houses coming onto the list for demolition than are coming off. And I think, uh, I don't know where it was at on the citizen satisfaction survey, but. I know at the neighborhood meetings, uh, they're not satisfied, and uh, I think we need to find additional funding for this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Councilperson. Demolition and public nuisance properties have been a problem my whole tenure here, and it takes time to get them through the system. Then sometimes there'll be a big bunch of them. There are a lot now. We'll look at that issue and how we might use CDBG funds. The problem we have is the CDBG is going down, the amounts we get yearly, and we do use it for other purposes uh, too, so we'll, we'll look at that within uh, light of the other areas that are funded with CDBG and see if we can do more. I talked to Larry earlier today. We ought to be able to look at this, and I mentioned to Frank this morning, maybe there's some way we could use some of these dollars to, to uh, help somebody re renovate some of these rather than taking them off the tax rolls and demolishing them but uh, you know we'll get those dollars back through taxes if they do go back on our tax roll yeah, and I think that's a good point we've done that sporadically once in a while when we had a property and and we were going it was on the list to be demolished we we're going to use the funds and somebody came forward a lot of times we don't have anybody to come forward but we'll look at how we can be a little more aggressive like that and give you some ideas it, great example of that the house just east of st joe's over there it was on the demolition list and uh, for a number of years and finally somebody stepped up yep. and it's a nice looking house now so is there any way that we can put some incentives into uh into motion for some of these people to come in some contractors come in and maybe take over some of these houses and fix them up or you know we need to we need to do something you know maybe take out part of the capital improvement and put it in here to to, to take these out because council member moore is correct every meeting <laughs> i've gone right. to there's blighted houses everywhere and you can drive around any neighborhood and you can find them and they're they're getting worse and worse and worse and we definitely need to take a good look at that i mean that is part of a capital improvement that is what we need to do yeah well we, we will uh, you know you you, you've approved a two-year budget, but the second year has to be approved yet. So right. we'll look at it in light of, of the budget, if it's a CIP, I, that would work. Uh, the CDBG has been profoundly where we have paid for demolitions, because most of them um, are in areas of low and moderate income that qualify for those funds. We have had some buildings recently that are uh, we can't use CDBG money on, especially large commercial buildings, and those are a tough one to, to tackle. Uh, yeah. There's one on the agenda tonight at church that we were able to link things together and make it work. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll ask uh, community development to look at that with engineering and finance and see if there's something we I can attack in another way. I have one of those big buildings in my ward. I think you do. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> it is your ward. We're, we're getting closer. <laughs> could, could I just ask that we um, incorporate Neighborhood Finance Corporation into the discussion because they would be a, li a, yeah. a likely partner in all of this. 
And I see Eric Burmeister out in the audience, and I think Polk County Housing Trust Fund might have some um, ideas as to how they could work with all of the parties as well. Okay. I'll move 22. Did you want to refer it or for further study and a report back, or what do you want to do? Oh, we could do that, refer it to the city manager for report back, but it sounds like you probably won't be until the next budget. It, it may be, especially for the CIP, but look, we'll take a look at the CDBG, where the funds are going, and, and see if we can give you a, you know, a quick status report and some ideas as, as quick as we can. I, I think it might happen sooner than that if you incorporate some of those other entities right. there with mm -hmm. the nonprofits, with NFC and the trust fund. And I know NFC has been very successful in securing NeighborWorks grants of yep. pretty significant mm -hmm. sums that this is they would qual we would qualify for. Yeah, that's a great idea. I yeah. think we ought to add, add uh, Habitat in there because they've taken some houses and restored right. them too. Yeah. So uh, I, I know uh, cities worked out with Habitat on a number of projects. <clears throat> Mr. Coleman. Sorry. Seven yes. <clears throat> All right, that completes the consent agenda. Uh, we have a couple of council requests from Council Member Joe Gatto to discuss a council initiated sidewalk assessment project on the east side of Southeast 14th Street from Indianola Avenue to Army Post Road. Mr. Gatto. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mel Pence. Great uh, neighborhood leader brought to my attention. There's nine properties on the east side of Southeast 14th from Army Post Road to Murray that uh, we need sidewalks on. And that would that would complete sidewalks on both sides of the street of a highway. I mean, it's a, it's a bus route. It's a safety issue. You know, we've got it. I think council did it a few years ago where you guys made sure that you had continuous sidewalk on the west side of the street, but we're going to... I'd like to see it happen. Um, I know it might not be until next year uh, as far as the funding goes, but I'd like to get this in queue and get this worked out to where we can continue the sidewalk and get it, get it done. So I would, uh, I would refer that back to, to uh, our city manager and get that, uh, get that on the agenda and get it taken care of. And, and that's what we'll do. We'll uh, go through what the process, what the code says on how to set up those assessment districts as well as look at the financing we have. You mentioned it well. We've got a small amount. We might need to do it there is. over multiple years. Uh, we'll take a look at that. There's, two, there's like. two specific properties that are, our developers are looking at, and those are two of the bigger ones. That would be the 3719 and the 3727. So if we're able to get that off there, that might take care of some of uh, That'd be good. Uh, the revenue. I'm not going to oppose this, but we got streets on each side. We don't have sidewalks on either side. Yeah, no. And well, there's, there's, and there's other neighborhood streets, but this is on a, it's on a, yeah. it's on a highway. So we need to. I, I just, I'd like to address that, and I, I understand where you're coming from. I have the same, same things on on I'm side streets that I have people. Add a piece to it. I, I guess if not uh, being opposed, uh, I would add a piece to it that we investigate and see if we can't at least have sidewalks on one side of the streets in our city. Absolutely. All of them. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Uh, what we'll do on that, there's kind of, if I've got this right, two requests. One, of course, is looking at the specific and set up an assessment yeah. district for, uh, to, for to get these. Area. And then there's a the question of sidewalks citywide, where they are, where they aren't. The right. school routes, we, we've studied some. And uh, we'll take a little time and give you a report of what that looks like. There's a lot of missing yeah, I, sidewalks. They said it was, I specifically asked that same question, Bob, and I think it was like $40 million to, to, <laughs> it's to, a, to, to it's, do the It's sidewalks. a biggie. You, you, you've done it well over the years. Uh, first of all, when development comes in, they put in the sidewalks for the area, but there are all those, those gaps, and those are a real, a real problem. That's what's showing up on 14th and other places. Uh, you worked really hard the last few years looking at school routes uh, as a priority, and setting up a pecking order of priority of use is is probably a good thing to review again. Yeah. I think all the main corridors should have it on both sides of the street. Bus routes, I mean, they, they need to be, you know, university, it needs to be on both sides of the street, all, all you know. But if it's $40 million, you've got to take it a piece at a time, so we've got yeah. to start sometime. Little by little. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to make a suggestion sure. on, on this to add, add to the discussion, Mayor. Um, 
two streets that I think of right away are East 14th Street and Hubble. They both have one thing in common. They're state highways as they run through the city. And, you know, I, as, as chair of the MPO the last couple of years, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to watch the amount of money and attention that other roads under the purview of, of uh, the DOT are getting a lot of attention. Highway 6 is the same west of I-80 mm -hmm. going to Waukee and Adel, and they're talking about another 50 to $100 million project out there. East 14th Street and Hubble are state highways going through our city. I'd, I'd recommend that, um, that the city of Des Moines do what the MPO has done pretty well the last couple of years, and that is schedule time at one of their public hearings in advance of their meetings. We have some good, pretty good friends of the city of Des Moines on the DOT now, and I think we should be there making a presentation about the, about the investment and maintenance of the state highways through town. I'd add to it that at one time we had a, an, a, a supposed agreement that there would be a point in time where Fleur and ML King would be a state highway. And we made a lot of investment in that roadway preparing for the state to take it over, the maintenance of it. So when I, you know, when I think about the city, I think a, a Hubble Euclid that's, that's pretty tired on the north side right. from East 14th Street to to 30th Street on the west, maybe all the way to Merle Hay Road, that's all a state highway, East 14th Street and others. And I, I think it's, um, I think we have friends of the city of Des Moines there, and they have money that they're investing in the same roadways. They just happen to be spent east or west mm -hmm. of 63rd Street on the west, mm -hmm. or, or uh, East 42nd Street on the east. And mm -hmm. I, I just can't take it anymore. So I'd like to go talk to them, yeah. uh, and it would be great if the mayor and the council would go with it, you know, make it a formal presentation on behalf of the city. I'd just like to add um, 63rd Street, which is also Highway 28. Yeah. And that's a, another big issue, particularly with the multifamily housing. Not a, not pedestrian traffic. Right. Yeah. Walking on the highway. Thanks to MPO and Rick Clark, we're going to get a new signal to East 46, and they're going to get a sidewalk along the north side. Right that up uh, so the kids can go to Delaware school. Yeah. Mr. Coleman. Seven yes. All right. That uh, it's time for us to open our hearings. It's uh, 5.02, and we'll note that the hearings open at that time. <clears throat> First item is item 39. It's on the application for a certificate of public convenience and necessity to operate tax cab services requested by Margaressa Jana of Capital Cab LLC. This item was continued from June 23rd of 2014. Council communication number 14-371. The hearing is open. Good evening, council members. My name is Luke D. Smet. Uh, I'm here representing Crown Cab and Magarsa Jonah in his application for a certificate of public convenience and necessity to operate his taxi cab company, Crown Cab, in the city of Des Moines. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Jonah is here today because he wants to provide a service to the citizens of Des Moines. He's been operating his Crown Cab company in the Des Moines metro area for the last several years and he thinks that he's ready to operate in the city of Des Moines. We also think that there's a need for additional taxi cab service in the city of Des Moines. And I'd like to take some time this evening to talk to you about why we think that's the case. Before I do that, I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about Mr. Jonah's personal background. He was born in Ethiopia and graduated high school there in 1990. He later worked in the country of Djibouti, uh, helping Christian missionaries teaching classes on the Bible. In, in uh, 2002, Mr. Jonah immigrated to the United States when he was threatened in Djibouti with prosecution for converting individuals to Christianity. Since coming to the United States, he's had a number of jobs where he worked uh, transporting people around different cities in the United States. In 2008, he began working for a hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, where he transported patients uh, for the hospital, some of whom had mental and physical disabilities. Uh, after moving to Iowa in 2009, Mr. Jonah attended uh, uh, Western Iowa Technical Community College in Denison, Iowa to receive a nursing degree. Uh, while he was in Denison, he spent almost another two years working uh, for nursing homes there, 
uh, transporting the residents of those nursing homes to medical appointments and other activities. <clears throat> Mr. Jonah then moved to Des Moines in June of 2012. He wanted to look for a new job, possibly start a business, and he understood that Des Moines was a good place to do that. That's why he's come to Des Moines and why he's uh, operated his taxi cab company and wants to do that here in the city. As I said, uh, Mr. Jonah began operating Crown Cab in Urbandale in 2012. Currently, his company has three drivers, himself and two others. Uh, he's been working in the <clears throat> Des Moines metro area, excluding uh, Des Moines. As I imagine the council members are aware, city count ordinances prohibit him as an unlicensed taxi cab company from picking up residents in, or picking up passengers in the city of Des Moines, but he's picked up passengers outside the city and transported them to place locations in the city. Uh, he also worked for a time as a bus driver for the Des Moines Public School District from March to June of 2013, which he gave up when the cab business picked up and uh, he uh, wanted to focus more on that. <clears throat> Mr. Jonah came before the City Council in September of 2012 with, the same, with a similar application for a certificate of public convenience and necessity to operate his tax cab company in the city. The City Council assessed his application and denied it at that time with feeling that he had no experience operating a taxi cab or a taxi cab company mm -hmm. and because of that lack of experience denied his application at that time. <clears throat> Since then he's been operating his taxi cab company. He has experience driving a taxi. He has experience operating a taxi cab company. We think that there, he's uh, alleviated the concern that the council had two years ago. At that same time, in the last two years, he's incurred no moving violations with his taxi cab company, and in fact has no criminal record to speak of. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Jonah's application demonstrates that he and Crown Cab meet all of the minimum requirements for a taxi cab company to operate in the city of Des Moines, and uh, because of that, we think that there's <clears throat> we think that there's grounds for him to be given an opportunity to operate his co company in the city. More than that, we think that there's a specific need for additional taxi cab companies in the city of Des Moines. Uh, there are several reasons for that. One is the growth in the population of the city of Des Moines. I just have a, sh a chart I'd like to share with you showing the population of the city of Des Moines in comparison to the number of taxi cabs available for operation in the city of Des Moines. <clears throat> in 2010, between 2010 and 2012, population of the city of Des Moines grew by about 2,500 people and during that time the City Council saw fit to add 10 taxi cabs into service uh, in the city of Des Moines. Between 2012 and 2014 there have been about another 1,200 residents in the city of Des Moines. We think that that's enough to justify the additional five taxi cabs that Mr. Jonah is requesting. Well, I will say that the 2008 population figure is an estimate that I came up with rather than anything, whereas the rest of them are uh, from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, additionally, the Des Moines metro area population has grown significantly in the last several years. A recent uh, business record article indicated that the Des Moines metro population has increased by about 30,000 residents from between 2010 and 2009, indicating that there's additional need for taxi cab companies in the city and in the metro area. Specifically, there's been growth in several areas that are large parts of the taxi cab business. The, De the Des Moines downtown is a large part of taxi cab business as well as the Des Moines International Airport. Both of those have seen significant growth in the last several years that warrant additional taxi cab service. <clears throat> The, Des Moines, uh, the downtown Des Moines has continued, has grown as the City Council has worked to improve the Des Moines, make it more attractive to businesses, visitors, and residents. Uh, that's why we've seen news reports recently praising the Des Moines downtown. <clears throat> A July 17th Associated Press article that was picked up by the Huffington Post discussed five free things to do in Des Moines' up-and-coming capital. Four of the five of those were Could we ask you to kind of wrap this up? <coughs> Um, the bell kind of signified your your time allotment. We're giving you a minute or two over, but uh, I think at least for the seven of us, we've seen all the Forbes articles and everything else. We're all for you. We agree with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, there have been several concerns uh, to public uh, objections to Crown Cab's application. 
And uh, what I would say briefly about those and is that uh, I don't think that there's a lot of substance behind the objections to Crown cabs operating in the city of Des Moines. And with the need for additional taxi cab service, we think that the application should be granted. If uh, any of the council members have specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I, you made a comment, um, sir, when you were talking about his background, that there was no criminal record to speak of. That was a poor choice of words. He has no criminal record. Okay, thank you. And then um, I, I guess one of the other questions would be on downtown and airport, and you, you focused on those. Um, is the intent that he would be available for all trips and not in, just focusing on downtown airport, or is that the area of focus? The intent is that he would be available for all trips. I was simply going to discuss the downtown and the, the airport growth as parts of the tax cab business that have seen growth and additionally just find the need for more taxi cab service. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? I, I guess I have a question on the on a notarized letter we received on a comment that was made. Uh, did you read that letter? I have, and I have several thoughts about that I'd be happy uh, to share with the council. <clears throat> I'd like to hear your thoughts. <clears throat> First of all, uh, one concern I have about this notarized letter is that it does not represent any illegal activity on the part of Crown Cab. The uh, person making the statement indicates that he followed Crown Cab in the city of Des Moines. It doesn't say that he saw Crown Cab pick anyone up. So there was no ordinance violation that's being reported here. Additionally, uh, I've spoken with Mr. Jonah and he's indicated to me that by coincidence, none of his three drivers were working the evening of June 29th or the morning of July, June 30th. So we find this entire statement to be rather dubious. Uh, Mr. Jonah has worked to within the city ordinances for the last several years and he would continue to do so and we would ask that you look at that rather than the fact than this uh, rather unsubstantiated statement made after his application was filed. Thank you for your statement. Thank you. Any other questions? Are there any other speakers? It's under on. members of the council, my name is Chris Pose, office address 317 6th Avenue, Suite 300. I'm here on behalf of uh, Trans Iowa, who operates both Capital and Yellow Cab here within the city of Des Moines, and stand in respectful resistance to the application of the applicant. Uh, the main reasons are that, first of all, uh, my client does not believe there's an additional need for a taxi cab service in the city of Des Moines. The number of 123 was rather painstakingly set by the council after review of study and figures relating to the needs for taxi cab service in the city. And my clients here to provide you information indicate they don't see an additional need for taxi cab service to city of Des Moines as a whole at this time. Uh, in addition, other taxi cab companies have indicated their resistance to the idea of this application. The council is also looking at, uh, in the future, modifications to the ordinance which would deal with certain ride sharing services that are coming to the city, which will be a challenge the city will be dealing with, uh, to not increase the number of cabs that are authorized to operate within the city of Des Moines city limits. We did file the letter with the statement of the driver who had uh, provided the information regarding the applicants being in the city of Des Moines and operating. Uh, we provided that for the council's information. Uh, we have seen in the past that companies that want to operate in the city actually do start operating in the city before they're authorized to do so. And so we always remain mindful and concerned that that may, in fact, occur. Uh, and we demonstrate a pattern of conduct that they're doing before they get the application approved as to what they may do after the application is, in fact, approved. I'd ask Randy to speak, and, uh, or not Randy, excuse me, but Lee Christensen with Trans Iowa, uh, who's got information as to their trips and what they're seeing in the cab market at this particular time, but we respectfully ask that you not increase the number of allowed cabs and, and deny the application. Mayor and Council, <coughs> Lee Christensen with Trans Iowa, our office, 1550 East Army Post Road. Just give you a little background about about our company. We operate 100 cars here in Des Moines through Capital and Yellow Cab. 
we have about 175 to 180 contract drivers depending on um, the season and, and the availability of drivers. Our average pickup time downtown, we average five minutes from when the call is placed until um, we are on site uh, picking up. Citywide, on an average, we are at 12, 12 minutes for citywide pickups. Um, the, the service we provide is, we believe, is, is, is good. Um, problem we're having is constant turnover with the drivers. Uh, we've recruited over 50 drivers this year already. Um, 15 of them have left already because they've been unable to make enough money to survive out there. Um, also, on, on if, if a new cab company was, was um, authorized, they need, the drivers need 15 to 20 trips a day. So that's going to be five cabs, be 100 trips a day, 700 a week. Um, you know, there's only so many people using cabs out there, and I, I just don't see that there's extra 700 people are going to call for more rides than what, what currently are going on. So I just ask that you deny the, the Crown Cab their certificate of necessity. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other speakers? We'd ask that everybody's going to speak on this issue to please come up and kind of get on the uh, south side of the building. Are these the last two speakers? Or maybe the last one representing somebody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening, Council Members. I'm Craig Finch. I'm an attorney in West Des Moines. My office address is 2700 West Town Parkway, Suite 170. I'm here representing United Cab Company today, and I have with me Mohammed Habib, the owner of United Cab Company. United Cab operates 10 cabs within the city and have done so since 2010. <coughs> Mr. Habib operated cabs in his native country and worked for a competitor here in the United States to learn American cab operations before striking out on his own and filing an application with the city. Crown, uh, United Cab oper participates in the cab stand arrangement that is currently in effect and we would ask that any companies that be allowed to operate cabs be ordered to participate in that agreement. We believe that United Cab's average pickup time is similar to Trans Iowa's, which would, in our case, we believe it would be in the 10 to 15 minute range. Uh, United Cab has traditionally tried to provide service to parts of the city that may have been underserved. We'd also point out that, as Jennifer, Jennifer McCoy from the city staff discussed this morning, it does not appear that the city's hearing a lot of complaints about lack of cab service. And I, in the letter that I sent to the council members last week, I attached a chart showing uh, trip numbers for United Cab. Those numbers, while they have increased over the last 18 months, appear to show with some seasonal spikes, some trending upwards, but it seems to be on a slow, steady growth path. And with that, I would indicate that United Cab does not believe that there's a need at this time for additional cabs, and Mr. Habib will expand on that. My name is Mohammed Habib, and then uh, my address is at 100228 Street in Des Moines. Uh, <coughs> the reason I, I just want to share with this with everybody, uh, in Des Moines, I mean, we obviously we know it's growing, but the taxi-wise, I don't think so. We grow in the last four years. I'm operating in Des Moines. I have a 10 cab, comp 10 cab, and then uh, my drivers they have to go in the airport, sit for a while before they can get fare. And in Des Moines, it's the, the cab we have right now. I think that should be. We, we don't really need any more because also. We have the customer right now, they're already confused. We have this all kind of company, they come and picking up on Des Moines without a city regulation. And also, 
when the customer lose their wallet, they lose their phones, and they don't know who to call anymore because they're already confused with their five, six, seven cab company in Des Moines. So I don't think so. We we need to confuse them more. Or they already are confused. So and I mean, I only have a ten. I would love to get another ten, but. Every time I mention, I see the, the numbers, I mention to my drivers, they tell me, if you get five more or you get 10 more, we're all gonna quit on you because we're not making enough money already. So, and I have a few driver quit on me already because of that. I mean, the more I grow, more money in my pocket, but also I gotta look at it the other side, if my people making money or not. If they're not making money, you know, I can't get another 10 because they're all gonna quit on me. So that's all I have to share. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Let's go ahead and close the hearing. Um, council, discussion. I, I can start. Um, the first big issue that we talked about when I got on the council in 1998 was. Uh, a new cab ordinance we've reviewed it several times and um, I, I have a lot of confidence that we're, we're doing the right thing and our principles in that are are um, 95 percent uh, complete I've talked a little bit about what dispatch means and some you know the way that we collect money at our at our steward shops but uh, I feel like we're we're doing the right thing on the application before us I said I'm going to support option two, which is the denial. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think it's our job to weigh two different factors. Is the applicant uh, worthy? Does he have the uh, standing and, and uh, track record of uh, responsibility? I know nothing to prove that he doesn't. And that is, uh, that's not the issue for my opposing uh, the process, their application. Um, you know, I. I know we have some uh, signed letters and notarized letters about different behaviors, but I don't have firsthand knowledge and, you know, one issue probably isn't going to sway me on that. Um, the second issue that the council has to weigh is the necessity. Um, and I don't believe that we have a necessity in town right now. And I think that we filled and maybe overfilled the required uh, level of cabs uh, a couple years ago when we added uh, license and the number of cabs in town uh, the applicant presented some information about population growth and made some some uh, other points that uh, that I think are instructive but I will also tell you that uh, dart ridership is up really significantly um, our our, um, our our population has grown dramatically in the downtown area where where while there's a lot of cabs they're usually taking people out to our neighborhoods not a couple of blocks away in downtown and so i don't believe that the population growth uh, necessitates uh, any increase every once in a while we're all invited to go talk to schools and all that this summer i talked about i got asked to speak to a summer school class about economics and government um, interaction what it does to the you know supply and demand and cost and I use the taxi cabs in town as an example about how when government regulates things it really changes uh, the way that industry behaves and in this case we've regulated this because we don't want poor people excluded from this service we want to make sure that there's reliable and safe um, transportation and so we license these companies and I think that we have an obligation to make sure that all of the requirements that we force these companies to abide by also has a certain amount of you know realization that they have to be able to be profitable in order to meet the expectations of the city and I think in this case adding more cabs in town could potentially I believe would um, dissolve the uh, how strong these companies are that are currently serving the city and by adding more cabs we could make the system weaker not stronger and that's why I oppose it Bill Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I too Chris I, I'm gonna vote against it as well uh, one of the things that as was pointed out you're just getting a churn of drivers in there 
I noticed that uh, when we had the first uh, expansion of any cab service, we went from 100 to 123 in the span of two or three years. That's about a 25% increase. So I'd say we, we made our mark in here. One of the things I look at also is that there's a, there's a defined universe of cab users. Uh, obviously, we, we have the, the cab stands down there in court. We're going to have them down there at the state fair. We got them out at the airport. Uh, Everybody knows that's that's going to be your, your universe to work from. Then you've got the, the uh, people that have the, the uh, uh, little runs to the grocery store to pick up this and pick up that. Uh, that's, that is not going to expand. And even though downtown is growing, one of the things that we, we've done a good job of is we've increased the DART ridership. We've uh, put a, a grocery store downtown, and we've uh, incented people to ride their bicycles to work, uh, ride their bicycles downtown. We've done a great job of doing that. So I don't see the universe of, of ridership expanding. I just see, as Chris mentioned, that we're going to be uh, taking away uh, opportunities for employment from people who just are not going to make it because we got too many cabs out in the street. And that just adds to more congestion and more uh, pavement beating uh, on the street. I, I just uh, think we're right at the right level where we need to be, and so I'm, uh, I'm not going to support it. Christine? And um, I am not supporting um, the expansion of the cab service as well, and uh, a lot of it's already been discussed. But I think we're in a period of transition with public transit, and we've talked about DART, we've talked about the bikes, we had a lot of discussion this morning that um, our traffic engineer brought to us, and I think all of that needs to be taken into account, and we need to let that um, settle down before we look at expansion. And I am very concerned about the, um, the economic impact on the current drivers that we have. And if we are having a churning impact, um, that's not good for the overall business and the financial stability of those companies. So um, for that reason, I will vote no. I just want to echo some of the things that uh, my colleagues have pointed out. Um, obviously, the economic for the people that are driving the cabs, if they're not able to get enough routes now, we don't need to put more cabs out on the street. That's pretty common sense. Um, as far as this application goes, I, I, I'm sure he's very qualified to do that, but I just think the need in the Des Moines area, I, I, don't, I don't feel that we need more cabs in this area, and that's why I, I can't support this. Anybody else? All right. We need a motion. Make a motion to. I'll make a motion to deny the license. Seven yes. All right. Item 40, and the authorization of a loan agreement and the issuance of not to exceed $32 million general obligation refunding capital loan notes for an essential corporate purpose. Council communication number 14-372, A, authorization for additional action. Is there anybody in the audience to speak to this item? All right. I'll move 40, 48. Been moved. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Coleman. Seven yes. Oh, now I'm trouble. <laughs> I was on such a good run. <laughs> Item 41, on a conveyance of underground electric line easements on city-owned property at 221 and 313 Walnut Street to Mid-American Energy Company for $1. Anybody here to speak to that? Seeing none, do we have a motion? I'll move 41. Yes. Seven yes. Item 42, on the sale of city-owned property in the vicinity of Southeast 6th Street and Shaw Street to Hanson Real Estate Services, Inc., for $251,350, this item was continued from July 14th, the council communication number 14-366. Is there anybody in the audience to speak to this item? Yeah. 
Good evening. My name is Troy Hansen with Hansen Real Estate, 5665 Greendale Road, Johnston. Uh, appreciate the opportunity for you guys to consider this and uh, in working with the city uh, staff and moving forward with our submission for the CDBG grant that was due last Friday. I just wanted to point out that this is a great opportunity for everybody in the city and, and the different neighborhoods. Uh, this particular property is actually considered to be in the historic East Village, but it's actually very close to um, I'm gonna draw McKinley yep. and uh, Pioneer Park. And uh, we've been working very closely with all the different neighborhoods. And I want to point out, again, as far as the conversations that have been going, as far as development in the areas, uh, in the other neighborhoods other than the core, and want to just reiterate the importance that this project brings in drawing these areas together. Uh, it fills a very large void uh, currently between these neighborhoods. And Southeast 6th, uh, with continued development, will actually help uh, spur future development and other uh, property owners and stakeholders to begin master planning their properties and to really start helping good development happen uh, down in the the other uh, neighborhoods other than the historic East Village. So happy to answer any questions and thanks again. Anybody? I I'll go ahead, please. Okay. I, I uh, I've met with Troy many times. We've met with uh, a lot of the neighborhood uh, leaders, and you know we've got a great response. I love the project. I think it's great. Um, a couple things. I want to make sure that this particular project gets built on this site. And I know you and I talked about this, and and, and that'll we're going to rezone it at a different on the agenda. But I want to make sure that uh, this particular one, if we're going to rezone it, that this is the one that's going to get. Uh, you know, this is going to get built, and, yeah, and I know that we talked about that, that yeah. uh, earlier today. And uh, another motion that I'd like to make, I, I'll, I'll move, move this after Councilman Moore has the time to speak, but uh, I would like to see this particular, the proceeds for this, to actually not go into the general fund, to go into, to help out the rest of the ward that this you know the proceeds is is is, is coming to you're selling the property i'd like to be able to use this in, in 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 that particular area whether that be maybe taking care of some of the blighted houses or maybe taking care of some of the parks that we need stuff and you know because I, I i see that we we have a need for that um so that's that's i i'm i'm all for your project we're gonna we're gonna work on it and do what we need to do and Troy, if your uh, project isn't successful with CDBGDR, are you going to go back to the drawing board, go back to the previous plans? I mean, what's going to happen here? Yeah, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we get the award, but we'd have to go back to the drawing board and completely reassess. And we, we understand the neighborhood's concerns, and, and to Joe's point, that, that we want to make sure the right kind of product is there. But, yeah, we cannot do this development without that award. Will you... Uh, be trying to hire locally as much as you can on construction? Absolutely. Um, we partner with Hanson Company, of course, and uh, Hanson Company's been here since 1979. And uh, through the Community Development Block Grant, we're required to use Davis Bacon wages. And uh, obviously, we got to follow those requirements in the Green Street requirements. So th that's the goal, yes. Thank you. So I'll, I'll move this and then. Can I refer the other portion of what I said about the the proceeds to to, to change the policy that we've got? So that yeah, I think we had it referred to city manager's office and, and legal to look at the policy that's in place on how we use the disposition of sure property funds on sales and come back to a work, bring it back to a workshop yeah. for um, additional review and discussion so that we can. Take action. That'd probably be a good idea. Uh, usually, we've taken the proceeds from a sale and put it back to maintenance or general fund needs. You know, it goes back to every ward, depending on what the need is. We usually do it based on merit of whatever is coming up. We have, from time to time, asked for you know, proceeds to go to specific things in specific places, uh, and we'll look at that and, and give you some suggestions and and see where you want to go as a full council. Well, yeah, I think because there's there's going to be some other projects that come up in different corridors and things like that when we sell other things that we're going to use those to purchase. So I, I think if we need to change the policy, let's take a look at it. And, and it might be an exception for this. Uh, this is, you know, it's a lot of money and, and certainly a big development for the area. And if we can have some historical data on yeah. what we've done the last 
okay. three to five years, I think that would be helpful. And how many dollars have been spread all over the city rather than any one ward when the prior when the sale has been made? Okay. I'm certainly for the project, but I, I, I got you. question where we're going with the dollars. Seven yes. Okay, item 43, items regarding the vacation of property in the vicinity of Elm Street, Southwest 6th Street, and Southwest 5th Street, Council Communication Number 14-367. A is a communication with the Planning and Zoning Commission, recommends denial, staff recommends approval. Uh, B, hearing on the vacation of the properties of Elm Street and Southwest 6th Street, right-of-way adjoining 300 Southwest 5th Street, and 300 Southwest 6th Street in conveyance of such right-of-way and other adjoining excess city-owned property to Harbuck Building and LLC and JB Doors partnership for $71,000. Uh, item one is first consideration the ordinance above and two is the final consideration. The waiver has been uh, requested by the applicant. Uh, if it would be Okay, could we get a quick update from uh, from Mike? Talk to us uh, quickly on the update uh, regarding the information that was supplied to Plan and Zoning and uh, the current staff recommendation. Sure. Mayor, County, and members of the Council, Michael Ledwig, Planning Administrator. Uh, before you tonight is a request to vacate uh, Elm Street between... Um, Southwest 5th and Southwest 7th. Uh, basically, uh, the main issue of contention at the Plan and Zoning Commission was an area right in the <coughs> vicinity. It was about a nine foot uh, wide area. Um, and at the Plan and Zoning Commission meeting, there was an objection by uh, the Beerman property about the vacation of that nine feet because they were concerned about turning movements into that alley. Uh, at the Plan and Zoning Commission meeting, the applicant could not commit that they did not need the entire nine feet. Uh, they didn't have uh, the design uh, drawn up at that point uh, to, to reflect the possible change. Subsequent to the Plan and Zoning Commission meeting, they did go back and, and revise their proposed layout for parking on the property. They now only need three feet of the nine feet that was proposed in front of the Plan and Zoning Commission. Had that been able to have been agreed to at the meeting, it would have resolved the uh, majority of the comments that were made at that meeting. It's also my understanding that with that revision to the request that uh, at least verbally they've received approval from the Beerman property ownership to that request, but the applicant can speak to that at, uh, if you have additional questions. Any questions, Mike? Thanks, Mike. All right, let's hear from the applicant. Mayor, County members of the City Council, Dan Manning, 317 6th Avenue, uh, Des Moines, Suite 300. Here tonight with, uh, with Kent Mock from Harbach, the Harbach Building LLC, Marvin Jones with JB Doors Partnership, and Chuck Bishop with Bishop Engineering. Everything Mike has just uh, shared with you is consistent with, uh, with what happened on July 17th before the um, Plan and Zoning Commission. Uh, the, the request was, can we back off of the nine-foot request? We just didn't have the opportunity at that meeting to make that decision. We've, uh, uh, sub, uh, Chuck Bishop was able to go back and make the changes that were uh, discussed and that Mike showed you this evening. Uh, in addition to that, I met with representatives of Beerman Electric on uh, Wednesday, the 23rd of July. Um, Gary Cornelius and Jim Schissel. Uh, showed them the new newly revised plans. Uh, obviously, the key was their ability to maneuver in the alley that uh, exists between uh, their property and Har the Harbach Building property. And uh, when it, after showing them those plans, they approved. Uh, I asked them at that meeting if I could share their approval with the other council members, which I've done. And so I think what we have now is a is a plan that. Uh, we certainly understood their concerns and tried to address them, and I think we have. And I think it's a good project, one that uh, is going to be critical for uh, the, the, uh, the plans that we have for the uh, development of the property to the east of, of that alley with the Harbach building. It's consistent with uh, concerns that the city, including enforcement, have had 
about how that property could be utilized it's going to be there is a all of the conditions have been imposed by staff we concur in and one and that is that uh, there would be no a no build uh, uh, agreement in the event that that would ever change we'd have to come back and look at that again and, and pay the you know whatever the value was for that property in the event that uh, that uh, some sort of building would go on that site. But right now, there's a, a major um, underground storm uh, stormwater easement. Um, so parking is really all that could be built on that property, and that's, that's driven the, the value, the purchase price. So I think that addresses all of uh, the concerns that staff has raised. Like I said, we're, we're, we're happy with uh, where things are. We're, we're, we're very happy that Beerman has looked at these plans and, and is uh, and has in, in, in essence uh, signed off on or agreed to them. So if you have any other questions for me, we'd be happy to answer them. Chuck Bishop is here. We have the plans. If you'd like to look at them any f further, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Manning, we also have item C under this, which uh, looks as though it requires a kind of a separate hearing. <coughs> Uh, and I might as well read that to the audience and to you. It's a hearing on the request from Kent Mock, purchaser of Rikon LLC, owner for the vacation of the following segments of the right-of-way generally located uh, south of Southwest ML King Junior Parkway, north of Elm Street, west of Southwest 5th Street, east of Southwest 7th Street, uh, portions of Elm Street between, between Southwest uh, 5th Street and Southwest 6th Street, <coughs> in B, Southwest 6th Street between Elm and Southwest ML King Parkway, C, portions of the excess right-of-way uh, for Southwest ML King Junior Parkway north of and adjoining Elm Street between Southwest 5th Street and Southwest 7th Street for $51,960. And again, they requested the first consideration of the ordinance and the second request uh, is for a waiver, uh, which is a request by the applicant. Um, any comments on that or I, I think everything that I've already shared would be consistent with our application under C okay just trying to tighten it up so we don't have we probably need to have two separate votes here but um, Ms. Hensley seeing nobody else I'm prepared to move it I know that they did work hard with the um, Beerman property for the Beermans um, on that property to address that issue and I know in reading through the minutes of the PNC meeting that that was really the major stumbling point so I'm glad that there's resolution to that and I'm comfortable moving item 43 and I'll look to uh, city legal uh, so let's page. let's have a vote uh, Ms. Hensley on 43 a and B one and two okay that's my motion Seven yes. And then without, uh, unless anybody in the audience would like to speak additionally, uh, let's have a similar vote on C, uh, which is the, the request from Kent Mock uh, for the very, various vacations. Move item 43C. Is there anybody in the audience one to and speak? And, and one and two. One and two. One and two, yes. Seeing none, the motion's been made. Seven yes. All right. Thank you. Item 44, on items regarding property in the vicinity of South uh, 714 Southeast 6th Street, A is an amendment of the Des Moines 2020 Community Character Land Use Plan to revise the future land use designation from park open space, general industrial, low medium density residential to downtown support commercial. B. A hearing to rezone a property owned by the City of Des Moines and the Wastewater Reclam Reclamation Authority from R160, one family low density residential, and M1 light industrial to DR, downtown riverfront, to allow development of up to a six story, 132 unit uh, multiple family dwelling. C is the first consideration of the ordinance above, and D is the final consideration of the ordinance above. The waiver is requested by the applicant and requires six votes. All right, is there anybody in the audience to speak to this? Troy Hansen, Hansen Real Estate again. Just wanted to reiterate my comments from uh, before. This is related to the same property and project. Item 42, correct? Yes. Yes, that is correct. All right. 
So do we? Do I have to do this A B separate uh, if I want to make the motion to only allow this project to have that type of rezoning? If he does not get granted the grant and not build this project, I want the zoning to go back to the same. I don't want. To, I don't. I, I think what we would have to do, you're rezoning it and it's rezoned, and the council can then, if it doesn't get built, you'll need to bring back a request for the city to initiate a rezoning back because we'll have to go back through the same kind of process, uh, rezoning it back to whatever you desire it to be, and a public hearing with the planning commission and back to council. But if you give us that warning, we'll watch for you and, and make sure to note if there's a problem with the project. When do you think, uh, Troy, they're going to uh, announce your words? I'm not sure what the schedule is internally, to be that's honest, as far as the year. That's what I thought. Yeah. As far as the award goes, I think the I think you guys present your selections to the state September 2nd, I believe, and then the state reviews all of the applicants. But you have in the application now. Correct. It was due last Friday. You, yeah. you already did. Yes. Okay. But we, uh, we have to. Yeah. The state ultimately he has to have the zoning for the state to consider. Yeah. I'm for uh, this project. I, the city the, attorney has a okay. I, I think the city manager has has uh, adequately explained it. Uh, there may be some level of comfort. Uh, my understanding is that the purchase agreement provides that uh, they are free uh, to reject the purchase agreement and uh, move back uh, from the from the uh, purchase and sale if they're not able to uh, get the zoning and if the, the agreement doesn't go forward with the state. So that would return the property to the city and allow um, for, for that mechanism. But as a general rule, you, you can't make the zoning con conditional on anything other than what the owner has agreed to in writing at the time of the rezoning. Okay. Jo Joe, can I jump in? And yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm very supportive. We talked about this earlier yeah. <coughs> of the project but but not wanting the project to fail to get CDBG money and then uh, have it on the market to sell to somebody else yeah. or somebody yeah. bring in um, tax credits or other things. So if if uh, at the end of the process w you didn't get it, it could re it could resort as the attorney says back to the city. Yep. But if you held on to it, would you support council action to um, revert the zoning? through a different action at that time? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a tough question. I mean, we, we'll do it. We're, we completely understand your guys' position on it. We have no intention of doing a product that's not supported uh, for this particular area. So um, again, this there's a lot of things up in the air as far as the CDBG award and so forth. So, um. Matt, you want me to comment? Mayor County members of the City Council, uh, Councilman Coleman, that really our ownership trumps all other issues. We won't convey the land to Hanson unless we have a deal that, that the City Council is comfortable, whether it's using CDBG or some other funding mechanism if they have to go back and change the project. But ultimately, we don't transfer title until we have a project that you're happy with. And if, if you go through the rezoning now, and if we can't work out a, out a project with Hanson Company, and we'll just we'll go back through and 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 undo what we did with the zonings and and move okay. forward from there. So owner ownership is kind of the king here. Yeah, but they they have an option on it. So what would prevent them from exercising their option on a legal basis? I appreciate you know the spirit with which you're coming forward, but we can have enough. I, I haven't looked at the purchase agreement, but we'll have enough language in the purchase agreement that uh, we won't sell them the project won't sell on the property unless it's a project that the city council approves of. Okay. I'll move A, B, C, and D. Item 44. 44, yes. Seven yes. Item 45, on the 2014-15 Expanded Street Resurfacing Program, Contract 1, Resolution Approving the Plan Specifications Form of Contract Documents, Engineer's Estimate, and Designation of the Lowest Responsible Bidder as Grimes Asphalt and Paving Corporation, Kurt Rasmussen, President, $1,497,824.65. Council Communication Number 14-364, A's Approving the Contract and Bond 
and the permission to sublet. Is there anybody in the audience to speak to this item? If See not, you. I'll move 45 and 45A. All right. That has been moved. Any discussion? Okay. At about a $1.5 million bid, how do you get it down to 65 cents that, that you're going to need it to get? The, I just marvel <laughs> at, at the size of, of, of the, the bid, and then they have the 65 cents. I, I mean, I've I got pocket change to take care of that. They're <laughs> very careful calculations going on here. I know exactly what every element is. Thank you. They want to make it look legitimate. 65 cents. <laughs> Item 46, on the ML King Junior Parkway, Hawk Signals, Carpenter Avenue to Hickman Road, resolution approving the plan, specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, and designation of the lowest responsible bidder as Baker Electric, Inc., Britt Baker, CEO, $289,341 and only 50 cents. <laughs> Is there anybody here to um, speak to this item? Seeing none, could we have a motion? I'll move. Oh, wait, that. and approving the bond permission to sublet. Go ahead. I'll move 46 and 46A. Thank you. And that's one we only had one bid on, if I remember yeah. right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. A little higher than what our, our engineers estimated. Yes. Bond. Yeah. Seven yes. Item 47 on the police station phase three facility improvements, resolution approving the plan, specifications, form of contract documents, engineer's estimate, and designation of the lowest responsible bidder as Ball Team LLC. Robert E. Sauter's president, $365,651.60. Council communication number 14 369A, approving the contract and the bond and permission to sublet. Anyone in the audience here to speak on this item? Contract for police station. <coughs> I'm bill 47, 47A. Seven yes. All right, that completes our hearings at 5:52. Let's go back um, now to item 36 which is council requests again, this time from council members Skip Moore and Chris Coleman to discuss low income housing. Which one of you gentlemen would you like to kick this off? Um, a lot of you have heard about the uh, Tomorrow Plan in Des Moines and a com component of the Tomorrow Plan is called Housing Tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I walked into the MPO meeting a week or two ago about five minutes late. Uh, Chris had already started a uh, talk about affordable housing and the MPO, but the MPO has agreed to do a study of affordable housing in the entire Des Moines region. And um, I checked today, they expect the study to be done in June of 2015. Um, I spoke with Chris about this. This is another issue that you can't go to a neighborhood meeting without hearing about affordable housing. Um, and we've actually got quite a few neighborhood groups that are getting together. They've got a task force looking into this. Uh, they feel as though there's quite a bit of affordable housing in Des Moines already, and they'd like to look around the region to see if it could be spread out more. Um, Chris and I talked about this, and uh, what I would like to do is refer this back to staff to take a look at a moratorium on affordable housing with the exception of senior housing and bring a recommendation back to the city council uh, as to a moratorium on this and um, they I don't know if they handed this to you or not Chris but it's called affordable housing tools used yeah. in Des Moines yeah it's more complex than you can imagine and I think that's one reason we need to refer this back to staff uh, for their expert recommendation on this hopefully in two weeks, but no longer than four weeks. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Coleman. Uh, thank you. I, 
I, I do agree, and as Skip pointed out, um, the region uh, last year uh, approved what we called the Tomorrow Plan. We, we as a region received a $2 million planning grant. Uh, the theory being that regions, not just cities, but regions don't do a very good job looking out decades. So could, could there be some pilot projects around the country that did this? They called it sustainability at first, but it was funded jointly by Department of Transportation, EPA, uh, uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, other groups joined in, Energy and, and uh, others of federal departments that worked with us. And one of the glaring issues that, that we saw is that um, as we look out at the cost of government 50 years from now, the jobs that employ uh, entry level workers and lower income workers are not anywhere close to where the housing is that exists. I don't think Skip or I, either one, or probably anybody at this table, think that we have enough housing units, safe, affordable units, for people in our community. We're, we're an older, poor community in many corners of our city. And so we have to address this. This isn't anti-low-income um, housing, but it is trying to have a plan that long-term we address this as a region not just the city of Des Moines. And as the Tomorrow Plan painfully pointed out, uh, most of the housing that the state and federal government subsidizes in the region for families is all here in the city. And I think the work of the MPO to lead this committee, Eric Burmeister is here, his organization is the catalyst for this study called um, Tomorrow Housing? Is housing, what? Tomorrow. housing Tomorrow. Um, I, I think we do need to look at what our rules are in this interim. I will tell you that last January, we talked about this when we did Rick Clark's review, and this was a goal of his. When he left, he put it on his list of things to address. We have rolled it in long term to the rewriting of the zoning code. But again, that feels like it's taking too long, and our neighbors are are revolting against us not having a plan. It isn't that they don't recognize there's a need for it, but they want the council to have a plan. And so we have to put this on the fast track, and we have to find a way to do it. Skip carved out a couple of things. Obviously, tonight we dealt with the CDBG money. We're not going to turn our backs on $6 million in the city, and so we need to keep working at that, is my opinion. Uh, Skip talked about senior housing. We have a lot of great developments that have happened and because we're an older community we should embrace that um, um, and and I, and I would hope and this is an idea that I've tried to champion um, that that uh, we would still encourage the rehab of this of existing complexes buildings and and houses um, that already exist that would be improved because somebody came in and used tax credits or something I can think of apartments and motels and all kinds of things that could be vastly improved if we dedicated our money to rehabbing projects rather than building new. We just have a, so those are the issues I'd like to pass to the, the staff, but I think sitting on our heels and uh, kind of having tunnel vision saying, hey, in two years we're going to have a zoning plan back and this is somehow going to address it. Um, that's just not good enough, and our neighbors aren't going to allow us to wait that long not having a game plan. We talked about two areas where sidewalks are a problem. You want to know something? We built hundreds of tax credit projects right in those strips where the sidewalk problems are. We haven't been very smart about the way we've done this, the concentration of them in some areas, and, and we just have to do a better job. And if we don't have control over it and a great plan, we need to have a moratorium on it. Is that fair, Skip, what we yeah, talked I about? I agree. Christine? Um, I don't know if Eric's going to make any comments tonight, but um, several comments I'd just like to make here tonight. You've got a number of projects, tax credit projects, that are coming to the end of their um, 15 years. So that's also a significant piece of this discussion because many times those are converted to market rate. It doesn't mean that they're going to continue as tax credit projects. Um, Iowa Finance Authority 
sets the criteria. And I know we've had discussions with Iowa Finance Authority, um, but the criteria is skewer skewered so that it attracts development projects in specific areas. So the other, the flip side of the coin would be to work to give incentives to go in um, non-qualified census tract areas. So I mean that would be an option that we need to look at and figure out or uh, an area that has less densities than some of the other um, areas. But um, I am not supportive of a moratorium at this point. Um, I think that would be problematic for us um, for a large number of reasons. You've got a lot of projects um, that are underway. Um, I concur that we need to do a better job of um, making sure that they're dispersed throughout the community. We've had discussions with um, Polk County Housing Trust Fund actually coming and having this discussion at the Metro Advisory Council. And um, there is a disproportionate um, level of housing in the city of Des Moines versus jobs being out in the uh, suburban communities. There is a mismatch. I mean, nobody can disagree with that. But it does not preclude the fact that we don't have a need for affordable housing, workplace housing. Not affordable, but workplace housing. There is a need for it here in this community, and so we can't just make a decision without taking this all into account and making informed, educated decisions and not letting our emotions get the better part of us. And um, so that's going to take a lot of the stakeholders to sit down and look through this, and Iowa Finance Authority has got to be one of the key ones. Eric's got a great group of people he's pulling together with the um, Tomorrow Plan Committee um, to start looking at this, which is made up of representatives from all of the metro region. So um, <coughs> there are a lot of things underway. Uh, I don't disagree that it could happen sooner, faster, um, but I'm not supportive of a moratorium if that's what's included in the uh, motion. Joe? Sure. Um, I've been a part of this uh, task force that started from the very beginning. It's a Cessna group, and uh, we some of the neighborhood leaders and we had a meeting last Tuesday and I guess some of the things that we discussed with them it's not no 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 we don't want these because we we realize there's a need for senior there's a need for for low-income housing there there is a need but unfortunately on the northeast side downtown area in the southeast side we have many 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 that have kind of taken over that whole area if you look at it through a map so I guess what, what, you know, the task force or the committee is, it, it's not, no, we don't want it, but yes, can we have it, but can we spread it out a little bit? And, and I think that's that's what we need to look at is instead of just saying, you know, I, you know we, we don't want this, we don't want this, but we do, but let's, let's spread it out through the suburbs and let's spread it out throughout the city. That's the biggest thing that I think that we should start looking at and, you know, because I'll tell you, when I was downtown this weekend and I was working there, I seen a lot of people that were homeless and, need, and were out on the street, and you know that they need a place to live, but they can't. We can't put them all in the same area. That's the biggest. That's the biggest problem that I think we're running into right now. But uh, I mean, that, that's where I sit at it. I mean, I know that we need it, but we don't need it in the areas that it's just been jammed into right now. So. And I agree. With, oh, excuse me. I agree with Joe. And I think what we got to also keep in mind, and visiting with Eric tonight, we still got waiting lists. There's people out there that needs housing, but I agree that we got to spread it out. I think the south side and east side is adequately supplied with uh, uh, affordable housing. Um, I'm following along with that as well. You know, it, it does seem that there is a pile that everybody pushes the, the affordable housing into, and it does seem to be over on the east side and southeast side. So um, keenly aware of that. Well, I'd, I'd, I just want to jump in here. It, I don't want to make this an east versus west side no. thing because it, it is all over. You can look at the development in and around the Drake area. You can look at a huge complex off of 63rd Street in the city of Des Moines going east on Creston. Um, there have recently been East 14th Street, East 22nd, and Hubble, where there's a concentration. But the, the, you know, there's a lot of issues with the concentration. The most important one that matters to me is 
that's not the best situation for the families that are in these facilities. You know, you, you need to get acclimated a little bit to a real neighborhood and diversity in the area that you live. And I'm talking about economic diversity and the different kinds of jobs and families there are. And I think if you put people in an area that's isolated from the rest of our community, they're, they're going to, they're gonna, by and large, um, become very similar to the people that they live with and grow up with. And that's what, I, that's what I think that we have to address. We give people the best chance of making a better life for themselves by putting them in diverse, different neighborhoods throughout the whole region, and not just in the, on the same street with 200 or 300 other families that are struggling the same way. Uh, Mr. Attorney, do you have any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm confident this is the intent uh, of the, the motions that were out. Um, whether or not council decides to go with the moratorium, uh, I'm, I'm confident that the moratorium proposed would be one that is consistent with both the Federal Fair Housing Act uh, as well as the Iowa Civil Rights Act. I believe that would, would be the intention uh, of the motion. Um, so I want to, want to make that clear. Uh, and it, it's very detailed, um, uh, both case law and statutory law that's out there on those. So I, I can tell you it would be at least uh, a month before we would be able to get something like that prepared if that's the direction the council goes. That, that's fine. That was the reason for referring it back to staff. And um, we'll take a look at what you bring back. Question for legal. Um, just assume that you come back in 30 days and that there um, is the request to go forward with the moratorium, meeting all of the guidelines as stipulated. Um, how would that be impacted based upon the timeline that we know that is out there for tax credit projects? How I mean, would those they're projects? They're typically yeah. due in December. Tax credit project applications are due in December. Generally, the, the moratorium the council um, imposes is to maintain the status quo. Uh, items that have been applied for prior to the creation of the moratorium generally pro process and proceed through. Uh, unaffected by the moratorium. So that that would not be inconsistent. Um, so there, individual developers that are, would be working on projects right now, going through the land acquisition, the rezoning, pro I mean, because obviously that takes quite a, le a long amount of time. So would they be caught in this if there was a moratorium or? It, it depends on where council wants to go. That's it, a matter of our policy, I, I, that, I would think. It, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, that's that's a really good yeah. good point. Um, it is a matter of policy. Council can make the ultimate decision, but the the a legally sustainable moratorium is going to be one that is extremely narrowly drawn, that uh, is designed to maintain the status quo, that uh, is as short as is possible to accomplish what it is that council wants to accomplish. So. As with other uh, zoning um, um, moratorium that council has had, uh, to, to put in a, a moratorium that goes for the next 18 months, that's going to be a real difficult thing for council to sustain legally. I mean, that's that's just going to be a real problem, as opposed to something that allows um, uh, an opportunity for review and and learned uh, decision making by the council. Uh, okay, I appreciate that. I, I just you know it. it to, to be perfectly honest, it just blows my mind that we would be having a discussion about a moratorium on workplace slash affordable housing in the city of Des Moines when you look at our population. I'm not insensitive. I'm very much aware of the concerns with the density that we have. But for us as a uh, policymaking body to sit here and think that we're talking about a moratorium on workplace slash affordable housing um, really is troublesome to me. And I think that there are other tools and mechanisms available to deal with this issue. It's not that I'm insensitive, I understand there's an issue, but um, I just think it sends the wrong message throughout the metro area for us to have a moratorium. I, I, I know that maybe that's not the recommendation that will come back, but I just need to be very clear about where I'm at on that issue. All right, I, else? And, and let me, let me, let me react to that. I think, the, I think the best way to create the most units and the most help for poor people in our town is the council having a sensible policy for how we're doing it. 
and right now we're not doing it. We're, we're passing through applications from developers that can make a lot of money to the state and the state doesn't take our input um, anymore. They used to. We used to be able to award points. If we didn't send a letter, they couldn't get funded. They've taken all those rights from us. And as a result, we don't have any policy that governs how we want this to happen. And I want more units. I want them to be sensible. Um, but, but you've seen it and we've seen it. Without a consistent uh, approach, the people we represent think that, 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 you know, that we're that we're simply buckling to the rich developers who are after tax credits. And, and we've seen them come out of the woodwork. Hundreds of people at Lincoln and, and other neighborhood meetings around the community when these things pop up. We, we have to be able to tell people we have a policy on how we're going about doing these and what kind of projects. I'm, I, you know what? I'd love that more units got funded this year than ever before under a moratorium that encouraged developers to go fix up the rundown properties that we already have in our community. Nothing would be, we wouldn't, we could, we'd get more applause for that and give more people safe and affordable and decent housing than anything else that we could do. And if a moratorium encouraged developers to think that way, that would be a really good thing for our city and we'd feel good about the service we provided to low income people. Okay. Mr. Moore, do you have a motion? Yeah, I'd like to refer the um, idea of affordable housing uh, back to staff uh, for consideration of a moratorium until the end of the MPO housing tomorrow study and possibly um, any other studies that are going on along with it but not to include, include uh, senior housing in that. Consistent with FHA and I yes, consistent with the federal laws and state laws concerning affordable housing. As we are voting on this issue, I think that uh, we've heard uh, a variety of opinions. Obviously, we're all uh, concerned about the future of, of housing and uh, for, for people, low, moderate income folks. Uh, there is a concern also about the concentration. How many of these units are we going to put here or there or, or whatever, and how, what is our plan? How are we going to handle it? In, in, within that, we all know that uh, we have lots of, of families on, in our public housing and also waiting for Section 8 and public housing options and opportunities. I believe at the moment uh, we have a five-year waiting list. We've got like 3,500 families waiting. So we have to be concerned about the future uh, for our city and for our citizens, give everybody an, an opportunity uh, for quality housing and what it looks like. But I also think that we have to look very closely at it where we put them, how we put it together, make sure that, that uh, we spread them out and, and they're fair and, and we do it in a very uh, understanding and compassionate way with the rest of the citizens of the city of Des Moines. Bob? Well, I'm not going to uh, support the, with the moratorium in this. I think we do need a program. I think I agree with Chris that we got to have a policy and go forward with it. But we just approved one tonight. It's a handsome project. It's, and here we go, <coughs> put a moratorium in on those things. And so I'm not going to support this motion. But that's not affecting what we've got out there. Is that, is that the way that I understood it? That's well, right. It well, this is to refer depends. to staff. We're not, we're not even going to see the language for right. a month. Okay. And the, the staff will accommodate those Thank things. You. Essentially, it's, okay. it's referring it to staff to come back uh, well, to tell us what it looks like. The moratorium yeah. discussion. It includes asking them to draft something that we would consider. Yeah. And for, for that, I cannot support it. We need a plan. That's the bottom line. I agree with that's, the plan. I, mean, I, I agree with the plan. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Five yes, two no. All right. Item 37. Uh, from Council Member Gatto to uh, discuss taxpayer quality assurance. Mr. Gatto. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I wanted to bring this as a discussion to my colleagues and, and uh, taxpayer quality assurance is, is just that. It's the quality quality that uh, we're spending our taxpayer money correctly. Can you hold on one second? Yes. Gentlemen, uh, we've got a, a, a Boy Scout troop here. Uh, where are you guys from? East side. East side, what pack? 99. Pack 99, how many of you are there? Uh, tonight, seven, and there's uh, probably 14 back. They'll be here in two weeks. They'll be here in two weeks. Thanks for coming down. Uh, these young people are, are our future, and uh, they're coming down and kind of learn about city government, so I'll bet you guys are really fired up now and ready to, to <laughs> jump in. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Let's give me a hand. <laughs> All right, go ahead. No sir. problem. I just wanted to uh, have a discussion about um, about uh, the the quality assurance that we're giving. First of all, we need to make sure that we're spending the taxpayer dollars and being a good steward of it. That means when we ha when we're having projects, and the county has a great model that I feel that we should be following, and that that is. First of all, training and safety ought to be a number one priority with apprentice programs. Our, our, our governor endorsed the apprentice program. I mean, that, that's something that we need to take a look at. And, it, and it's very simple. What, what we can do is, is there's a simple questionnaire that the county has. We, we have them fill it out, our contractors. We do it for any vertical project over a million dollars, in excess of a million dollars. We take that into consideration of when when it when it comes in front of us, and you know we we make sure that we are handling. I'd like to see all local contractors. I'm sure that's not probably going to happen, but uh, you know I, I just I I feel that we have a duty to the taxpayers to make sure that we're hiring good quality people, local people, safe people, good trained people to give us a quality product, because as you know. All of us probably can agree upon cheapest isn't always the best and I understand that that's the law that we have to take the cheapest bid uh, or the lowest bid I shouldn't say cheapest but uh, you know it, it would be nice to make sure that this guy is with this guy and they're going to give us the same quality of work and that's the biggest thing that I think that we should look at uh, I can uh, we can listen to some discussion I can give it I'd like to have legal have a I'd like to refer it back to, to our city attorney to prepare a resolution creating a council policy regarding use of the taxpayer quality assurance questionnaire similar to that of what Polk County uses of any vertical project in excess of a million dollars. That would be my motion to you. Christine. Interesting night for discussion. It is. <laughs> um, I'd like to um, have some additional items as uh, part of Joe's motion that would be included in that. And um, I guess the, the one issue that I'd really like to have addressed is what problems have we specifically had? So when we're looking at this information and coming back, I'd like to have um, a list of those problems that have been done um, as it relates to city construction projects and be very specific as to what those problems have been. Um, number two, how are we going to enforce this? What's the cost going to be of enforcing this to administer this program? I guess number three, um, we've talked about it several times recently at this council table where there's only been one bid. You impose additional restrictions where you've got projects in the city. If you look at the bidding atmosphere right now in the city of Des Moines, um, our bids are going up. And there are many times that the bids have come in higher than what the construction estimate was. So why would we be adding additional burdens right now and requirements when we have fewer bidders? City projects are going lower on the totem pole above private projects, but we're imposing additional requirements on them. So there's a real disconnect here. I mean, if we're going to go about and do this, uh, when you're in good economic times, you don't require additional restrictions. Um, so I'd like to know how we see that being impacted. Um, the $1 million requirement, I know that the county's requirement is much higher, and I'd like to know what will be the impact if 
um, how many projects are we talking about this require being required for 1 million versus 10 million versus 25 million I think that's extremely important and um, you know if you look at the track record on those entities that provide the training and recruit individuals through these apprenticeship programs the national programs have the worst track record of anybody in, re in attracting minorities and we would be putting them in a place where they would have to use those so I, I, I want to get information on that and make sure that we understand that Bill, can, I, can I just address one, one, one thing real quick? Just because we're only getting one bid, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that we don't sh still have to be a good steward of our taxpayer money and, and be able to give a good quality to make sure that we're getting quality bids. I guess if we're only going to get one bid, if it's not a quality bid, then we better send it back out again. You know, I, I don't think that we should, you know, ante up what, just because we're only, you know, we're, Public, public, we're not. Public bids aren't getting the the respect of a private bids. Well, we still got to build a good quality product for for our taxpayer. Otherwise, we're going to be spending money five years down the road to fix what we didn't do right the first time. No. But give us examples of those. I understand. I agree. I agree with Joe as well. I uh, I had the opportunity to go through the uh, building trades and see some of the training programs they've got. And before somebody gets out there to do a, a job, they've had a good amount of training. And what I've heard, I don't, I can't substantiate it, but you know, if, if you have somebody that uh, hasn't been trained on running a backhoe, except to show them where the ignition key is, uh, that's not putting quality back into our, our homes, our neighborhoods, and our businesses. Uh, you know, I'm probably one of the most frugal people out there. But uh, you know, if you get a quality product and you can put it out there, people don't mind spending a little bit extra. And uh, I think it, it, Joe's uh, idea here to try and, and at least get a quality assurance started and, and have some way of documenting it. And, and if the county's already doing it, at least we have uh, a template to work off of and, and be able to build this so that we can have a quality product that we're putting out there on a consistent basis for our citizens. So uh, I like Joe's idea, and, and I want Christine's uh, uh, comments also put in because we do have to have some documentation. Documentation I'd like to add to that based upon the county model from what I understand in the last 10 years it's only been used on three projects right. so could that be three to five, three I, to five. we just need to have it confirmed and what's been the dollar amount and what was the criteria okay we got it mr. Uh, attorney the, one of the things I just wanted to make clear for clarification of the motion um, uh, uh, all the information that uh, councilmember Hensley's re requested is is uh, great information and happy to provide that but I just wanted to make clear that the manager will be helping uh, me do that and his staff and not no. his legal staff because that's way beyond uh, uh, what we, we would normally do. So I'd, to I'd like to refer some things to Diane real quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple comments, Joe. I support your motion. I have, um, I served on the pre-qualification committee in the late 1990s when, when we tried to, you know, find a, a a middle ground to take a step forward um, th that um, that was a pro process I described it to some people earlier that maybe we overreached on a little bit and as a result it never really got grounded um, we got to bring our staff along and see the benefits to this during the day uh, I talk a lot about the, the 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 quality of workmanship and the reliability of companies and you know my favorite thing to to say is you know just because it's free doesn't mean it's worth it and that is that's often uh, the same for uh, not using the tools that we have the the state laws provide for it we have to take the lowest responsible bidder but we can we can use some good judgment on who that is I've I've always worried that we would adopt a project that eliminated competition and so we need to do this in a way that you know we still get competition I don't think um, yeah I'm a, I'm a real big fan of the building trades I, I think uh, you know I think the member unions of the building trades have um, have earned their clout because 
uh, they've proven up. They have skills and, and abilities. It's just not that they march around in big numbers, but they really have skills that, uh, that they've developed. As much as I'm supporters of those, I don't think that we can adopt a program that would restrict it only to trades. You know, there, there has to be a way for businesses to prove up on training and other things that they have a competent workforce. And, and so I think that's, that's fair. I think we need to do it on projects that are bigger and significant. And, and uh, you know, we use the term vertical infrastructure. This would mean it wouldn't be for roads. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, most of our road work is done with state or federal money anyway and comes with, um, you know, some, some rules that already govern that. Uh, and, and so this vertical infrastructure, we can, you know, I, I don't know if Christine asked it directly, um, but, uh, you know, I think if we look back over the last five years, how many different projects have we had? How many do we expect in the CIP that, uh, that would, would do this? And could that be instructive in us setting what the threshold is? You know, um, and, uh, and I, I think we, you know, we have a seven-year CIP. Um, I, think, I think that this is all wise. In the end, uh, we need to put people to work. If, uh, if, uh, if, if, we, if we really think that uh, we have good workforce and we can get the biggest bang for our dollars by working with the very best contractors in town, um, that's going to be good for the projects that we're funding, but it's also going to be good for people because more people are going to go to work. And more people are going to spend money in the city of Des Moines yeah. mm -hmm. that live here. This Mayor still won't relieve us from choosing the lowest qualified bidder. I mean, you, you've got to have qualifications, but we still have to look at the cost of the projects. I mean, whether they, uh, you know, the pre-qualification has no effect on us being able to choose the lowest qualified bidder. But Skip. it clearly adds costs. Skip, it, could we open this up to public comment? I do know there's some people here that will tell us some of the horror stories um, why we should be considering this. Well, I'd be happy to do that. And, uh, but I would like to, uh, um, you know, th there's part of me that they would like to have sort of a discussion around some of this uh, as it relates to horizontal projects as well. It, it, we have seen a few in and around where we've had some issues. Um, I have heard some horror stories myself but I would want to make sure and ask legal, is there any way, uh, you know, when we get bids, sometimes the, uh, a number of them tonight, um, you know, allowing uh, uh, subcontracting out. And I just want to make sure that, that our contractors, we want to make sure the workers are well paid. We want to make sure that they're well trained. And then we want to make sure they understand safety. But I also want to make sure that whoever's hiring them, that we're hiring and we approve their bid, is paying their workers. I'm going to tell you here what they've got. So, anybody have a um, good. Yeah. something they would like to say in this? We could open this hearing up uh, here for a second, and uh, we have one speaker here. All right. How many folks do we have? All right, so we have three. Four, five, six. All right, council, what do you think? Three minutes? Three, yeah. Uh, six, minutes. Okay, begin, give us your name and address. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Vanessa Marcano Kelly, and I live in Des Moines. I live in 5505 Aurora Avenue, um, and the zip code is 50310. Um, I'm here with uh, Iowa Citizens for, Com for Community Improvement, Iowa CCI. Um, I'm a member, and, and I'm also uh, an organizer there. And um, I wanted to submit. Um, for the consideration of the council, um, I have this material. I may not have had enough uh, copies, but I will try to leave behind um, all of the ones that I have. Um, let's let's put one. Uh, could we have a motion to receive and file, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and. All in favor, say aye. 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 
Sorry, go ahead. No, that's that's okay. Thank you. Um, and it's it's really interesting to hear this conversation happening um, about uh, ensuring that public projects go to responsible um, and good companies that are, are paying people correctly, that are training people, that are ensuring their safety. Um, and I, I heard one of the council members talk about uh, the, the need for some documentation. So, so I'm going to go back and, and refer to the packet. Um, wage theft is a really big problem in Iowa and all of our state. Um, there is a study that, that is, in, is in your packet, and it's costing uh, about $600 million every year to Iowans. Um, and I'm going to tell you uh, a specific story um, that happened with a company named Pablo Roofing. Um, and a man, a worker, uh, that is also a CCI member, um, who could not be here today, but he spoke to, to us, and we've been working with him. His name is Omar, and he worked with this company, Pablo Roofing, in a Birdland shelter. Um, that It was a bid that was given to Pablo Roofing. Now, Pablo Roofing has been sued by Iowa Workforce Development on the issue of wage claim on unpaid wa wages um, at least 13 times. Um, and they still, and they have a record going back until 1999 at least. So how could it be that this company received, um, was, it, was given a bid by the city of Des Moines for the renovation of these parks in 2013? They've had track record after track record of um, the state going after them uh, for, this, for this issue. And actually, um, the Polk County Court awarded Omar um, not only his wages, but damages on this company, and he has not been able to collect. Um, and so there is a need to do at least a background check and make sure that these companies that are getting these bids um, are not being sued 13 times by, by Iowa Workforce Development and getting, still getting city bids. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Eh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Jesús Rodríguez. Hi, eh, good afternoon. My name is Jesús Rodríguez. Eh, nosotros como miembros de la de Dimoy eh, venimos a, a pedirles a este honorable consejo. So we as, as uh, residents of the city of Des Moines, we come here to ask this honorable council que adopten algún sistema verificador to adopt, cuando se contrata alguna empresa to adopt a system that verifies uh, every every company that is trying to para que realice algún proyecto en vista de que algunas empresas que hacen proyectos para Dimoy no pagan a sus trabajadores. Uh, so th that they adopt a, a system to verify these companies that are trying to uh, bid for public projects, given the fact that there are several companies in the city that do not uh, pay their workers um, once they have been working on the project. El, el consejo le paga a estas empresas, pero ellas se quedan con todo su dinero, no obstante, de que los trabajadores de los sectores vulnerables en su mayoría les hacen su trabajo pero no hacen llegar el dinero que les corresponde. So this the city gives uh, this these bids and this money to these companies that then are able to to gain and, and profit and then they, that money doesn't go doesn't end up in the in the pocket of the workers that actually did the work in these projects. Y es por eso de que en esta oportunidad Como miembro de CCI y residente de Dimoy, venimos a pedirles a ustedes de que adopten algún sistema de verificación que cuando se le dé un proyecto a una empresa sean de estas que no roban salarios a sus trabajadores. So that's why as a member of Iowa CCI and as a resident of Des Moines, I come here to ask this council to adopt a, a system to verify uh, whether these companies have indeed paid their workers or not. Gracias, señores. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Sushma Chauhan. I live in Des Moines. I've been a uh, uh, resident of uh, State of Iowa for since 55, and I have never seen it this worse. I mean, uh, right now we got a whole bunch of contractors hiring people, and I know the city and state got to go with the lower bid, but that's the ones that are not paying the people. That's how, why they've been able to go lower than any good contractor. Good contractors are losing because we've got a lot of cheap contractors. They're not paying their workers. They don't have insurance. They're not bonded or nothing. And they're the ones that are getting the contracts instead of good contractors. And that's what's hurting all the community here. A uh, lot of these contractors, they're not paying the people. That's how can they go low. <clears throat> and I mean, uh, it's getting worse and worse every day. It's not just uh, for one people, it's for everybody, you know. And I'm sure you guys uh, understand because, I mean, I think you guys, it's not the first time you probably heard this, you know, that uh, all these contractors are ripping people off. They hire you, they hire for two, three weeks, they pay you a week and they fire you, they don't pay you. You take them to court. I know because I was, I'm one of the victims. I took them to court, I won my case twice and still haven't been able to collect any money at all. And I don't think that's right at all. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the council for letting me speak. Uh, I would, uh, my name is Mitch Henry. I live at 1900 Martin Luther King in Des Moines here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Councilman Gatto, uh, Councilman Gray for, for your comments. I'm also here on representing LULAC Council 307, League of United Latin American Citizens. Um, I, I think the key here is the, the responsible bidder. I mean, the qual uh, you have lowest qualified bidder, lowest responsible bidder, but I think whatever it is, that, that bidder uh, the, uh, needs to be responsible. And, uh, you know, if they agree in paying their workers uh, whatever amount, that they follow through with that. Um, our concern is that we do have uh, Latino workers here in Des Moines. Uh, some are working for the contractors and, uh, you know, others working in the private sector. Uh, it's, it's easy for uh, some of these contractors to take advantage of their workers. I do agree, most, most of the contractors do a very good job uh, and uh, a responsible job. But uh, I think it's time, you know, we, we look at, you know, pre-qualifying our bidders if possible. Uh, I like uh, Mr. Gatto stated, like the county does. Uh, so I think uh, on our projects, be it, uh, you know, uh, up and down or horizontal or vertical, that we can, uh, uh, to the best of our ability, uh, you know, use pre-qualified bidders. And uh, I would like thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Mitch, do you know, has the county had any situations like this that uh, contractors has not paid their uh, help? Not that, I'm, not that I'm aware of. But, but as you stated earlier, I mean, the county uses somewhat of a different process, mm -hmm. at least with, with some of their contracts. Um, they're major ones. Uh, so, you know, I, I would hope in the future that uh, whatever the project is, that, you know, again, you have a responsible bidder. And, uh, I mean, you know, some kind of background check, you know, if possible. I don't know if that's been done to most, if, if not all bidders in the past, but I would hope in the future that, uh, I mean, that's something you could check on. I mean, it sounds reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with any job you're going to get, I mean, if I'm a, I'm a homeowner and going to get a job uh, on my house, you know, I'm going to look at their, you know, the qualifications. I'm going to look at their pack, past work history and, uh, you know, get references. Yeah. I mean, it sounds reasonable. I think both uh, I and, uh, you know, our local government entities uh, should do that. I think we look at the system they use, if they've been successful, we ought to be able to address some of those issues. Yeah, and they, of course, worked in some very large projects. Thank you. Hi, my, sorry, my name is Bridget Fagan. I'm a member of Iowa CCI. I live at 3424 Cottage Grove Avenue. Um, for years, we've had folks coming into CCI with problems with workplace conditions or just not getting paid. Um, obviously, with the report by Iowa policy project that's $600 million a year is stolen from Iowa workers, and we've seen it, obviously, in Des Moines, like I said, with tons of people coming into our office. We've recovered over $150,000 just alone here at Iowa CCI, um, and we obviously have an example of um, a time where uh, the city did give a bid to a contracted company 
and obviously they weren't paid. So I think this is an opportunity for the city to do the very minimum and make sure that our employees are treated with respect and at the very minimum getting paid. So thank you. Thanks, Bridget. All right. Um, let's close that uh, hearing and discussion. Skip. This, of course, concerns me. If you're not paying uh, the wages, then your employees are not paying the taxes. They're not able to. And I don't think that that reflects very well on a government body if we would support anything like that. Um, I, too, have been worried when we only see one or two bid bidders on a project. And I think the real issue here is that responsible is very vague. It's not spelled out very well in the law, what responsible. But I have called some local contractors that I would consider responsible contractors. Uh, they pay living wages, decent benefits. They pay their workman's comp. Um, they pay their own taxes. It just goes on and on and on. And I ask, why are you not bidding on these city contracts? And their reply every single time is, we're just wasting our time bidding against unresponsible bidders, and they're going to get the job because of the way we're handling it. Now, <clears throat> the issue we heard about the roofing company, that wouldn't fall under what is being proposed tonight. But I still think it's something we need to take a look at. We need to do background checks on contractors. Uh, this roofer that has been presented to us has a long history of not paying their employees and why we would hire them twice um, is just beyond me. And um, as, a, as a steward, all of us up here are steward of the taxpayers' dollars. I think that uh, we owe it to the taxpayers in Des Moines to protect the people that we're hiring and provide the best product that we can. And, and this is one way we can do it is with the start of taxpayer quality assurance and I'm going to support the motion. All right. And the motion is? Refer it back to the city attorney. I think he's got it, don't you? We already voted on it. Yep. Okay. With the request for all of the information. Right. Yep. Yep. All right. I'm, I must uh, add a comment. This last three items have given us a lot of fairly large work um, assignments. Uh, the citywide look at the sidewalks, the look at housing and how we, how we as well as the region and how we might do a moratorium and, and uh, the taxpayer quality assurance item. I think we understand to do them as quickly as possible. We have other items we're working on at the same time. Let me assure you we will get them back to you as quick as possible and if we're, we're we're needing more time we'll give you a update of where we are but this is this is quite a few assignments we're on fire tonight okay can you bring because we had such a short meeting last time that's, that's right, right. <laughs> you, are you guys okay with this if they bring it back let's say first meeting in september yeah that's fine I give you a little time and, and if we can get it quicker we will it's just so many people and these are big issues to sort through and we'll make sure you've got the right information okay all right item 38 is from Randy here Des Moines to speak regarding political decisions is Randy here He's coming. Oh, here he is. My name is Randy here. I'm homeless. I was here before about a year ago. Complaining about my life in every area in it. Since then, it's only gotten worse. Uh, I've lost my license twice that I acquired. Once by family members. And somehow the authorities were working with them to the tune of 10 grand. <clears throat> Okay, I paid that off. Happened again. Cost me $5,000. Went in there for a address change. It came out with somebody else's IOID. And I know the gentleman. 
so much for that. Uh, the attorney I got, uh, we lost the case. Uh, they asked me, why did I come in there and, and with a, Iowa, or a driver's license and want an Iowa ID? Which is an absurd comment. My competent attorney went along with him and asked me why I was doing that. And I said, what are you talking about, Pat? Anyhow, we lost the case. I filed an appeal. She fails to do the paperwork in the 20-day uh, lot of time. I lose that one also. Uh, terrible legal judicial opinion. Supreme Court, in my opinion. That, that's my transportation. Okay, and my uh, money institution. I've had three different episodes. 24 grand. Uh, you guys can look into it. I'm not going to put the heat on, on different places. Uh, 500 at another one, and most recently I'm fussing with Tradesman Credit Union. And I'm sure my union guys all hear about it. Uh, the FBI went in there. I was nice enough uh, at that meeting a year ago. Uh, the very honorable Judy, you guys' boss, Brad Shaw, gave me some pointers. They would look into it there because my 1500 didn't fulfill their 500 grand, but they got enough complaints. Everybody's out there except Randy, the guy I got my loan from. Yeah, that's proxy identity theft. I hope he hears this. And the other people, this is some murky area, if we know what we mean. Most recently, my shelter. This one, I'm out in the street, 65 years old, moved here in 1958, blah, 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 blah. I'm on a list, and there's places open all over town, and I'm living out in the bush, getting bit to death. Last night, and that's where I'm heading here, as soon as we quit using each other's time. Uh, I've underwent uh, bed bugs, head lice, scabies, and I gotta say this right, scarred, Fluxulitis, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Uh, I've still got conditions. I don't know what it is. Four different uh, prognosis, diagnosis. They're not getting, I think it's head lice and they don't want a lawsuit. I've got a lawsuit going on that anyway with the very competent uh, legal uh, backing. Uh, being you know, in big labor and behind the scenes and under the table and instrumental in restoring the, the national housing community, a tent doesn't seem like a very good, you know, uh, switch off there. So we want to keep our eye on the feds. They, they tend to, yeah, you know, get led astray. Uh, that's about it, you know. The, the other one here, the, the NSC. Uh, this national or international snowman or whatever his name is, I submit to you, we've got an original around here long before that. Why do I say that? In the Freedom of Information Act, I, I wrote them 20 some years ago. The response, embarrassingly, in, is, uh, Mr. Hill, we've got rooms full of boxes of information on you. My question would be, why? I'm not a threat to nobody. I'm sitting going at 66 years old. I'm an old worn out construction worker. That might need to be looked into. Uh, that's about it. You know, the, I was going to tease you about the city manager. We've already been there. Uh, some of these things going on in the governorship, and, and not to get sides the aisle, you know, my mom was the righty, my dad was the lefty, but yeah, I might be suffering from some of those decisions, you know? So uh, I'd like to thank the council for their time, patience, putting up with me. If you can think of anything, you know, so I won't have to wow wow so much here in front of you guys. And uh, thank you. You bet. Have a good day. I'll move to receive and file. Receive and file comments is the motion. Thank you. Seven yes. All right. That takes us to item 48, which is first the amendment to the Urban Renewal Development Agreement with Market One LLC to address utility relocation 
in the 100 blocks of East 3rd and Southeast 3rd streets adjoining the redevelopment project, Council Communication Number 14-362. Anybody here in the audience speak on that? Seeing none, we have a motion. It's been moved. Seven yes. Item 49, actions relating to the request from Coppola Enterprises to create an urban renewal area utilizing tax increment financing for the Echo Valley Development Area to initiate negotiations or preliminary terms of agreement for development of an area using project generated increment and authorizing use of special counsel. Anybody here, Council Communication Number 14-353, anybody here to speak on this item? Christine? Um, I am excited about this project. I'm happy to move this. This is a very important first step. I know that um, city staff has sat down and talked with several of us on this, just answering questions and I think really kind of brainstorming because this really is going to be a template for other development projects along the Highway 5 corridor. So we want to make sure that we've taken all items into consideration. Uh, but I am really excited about the ability of the city of Des Moines to offer executive level housing, which is, I think, a real um, gap in our current housing stock. So um, I'm happy to move item 49, uh, 49 and um, excited to have it come back with us. I know there will continue to be a lot of discussion and work to make sure that this is all addressed, including all the related services and, and um, financing for this project. I, wa I want to underscore and just put on the record, I, I do think this is a great project and great to have in the city of Des Moines. Um, my concern isn't about this project. But it's, you know, the next one and the next one as we work our way east on, mm -hmm. on um, Highway 5. Yeah, and, and I hope before we act, and I mentioned this to the city manager last week when being briefed on the project, um, I'd like a plan for how we wean ourselves off of this and how we can do it quickly. And before we vote on this in final form, that we've approved that policy or that plan so that there's, um, so that we're as transparent as possible with developers and, and other projects further down the road. Um, we, we need something to kickstart this. I'm thrilled that Coppola, Scott, uh, the whole team is doing this. Um, this is more about how do we use this the way we want to as a jump start, but not let it be precedent setting for the whole Highway 5 corridor. Seven yes. Item 50, items regarding the downtown's self-supported municipal improvement district, the Smith, Council Communication Number 14-370, A, the budget for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2015, B, the operating agreement, C, the parking garage service agreement, Council Communication Number 14-360. Anybody here to speak to this? I'll move item 50, A, B, and C. We had an um, in-depth discussion and presentation this morning, so happy to move it. Seven yes. Uh, could somebody give us a motion to adjourn the City Council and reconvene as Board of Health? Move. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 We now sit as Board of Health. Item A is approving the legal department to proceed with court action seeking authority to abate the public nuisance at the following locations. A, 1107 18th Street, it's a fire damaged main structure. B is 1817 24th Street, it's a main structure. C is 732 Southeast 28th Street, it's a main structure and an accessory building. D is 429 East Dunham Avenue. It's a garage structure. And E is 700 East Granger Avenue, another garage structure. Is there anyone in the audience to speak to any of these items A through E at those addresses? I'll, I'll move A, B, C, D, and E. Any discussion? Items been moved? 
Hearing none. Seven yes. Seven yes. <laughs> Item two is a notification from Selena Insurance Group uh, dated July 2nd of 2014 stating they're insured Tamara Harvey and Richard Harvey of 811 Bancroft Street sustained a fire loss and they are holding a fire escrow demolition reserve in the amount of $10,000. Is there anybody here to speak to this item? Again, it's a notification from the insurance group. Could we have a motion to accept that notification and receive it and, I guess, file it? Move. Move. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes. Could we have a motion to adjourn? Move. All in favor say aye. Move. Opposed? We said adjourn. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>